we started this week by talking about edges then we went from edges to blobs to corners and then talked about different a few varieties of corner detectors and talked about an important corner detector called sift talked about the feature descriptor of how you would describe your corner as a vector and then last lecture we also talked about image segmentation now we are also going to talk about other kinds of feature spaces that people worked on in computer vision before deep learning came into the picture that's going to be the focus of this lecture one of the other important feature representations that was developed was known as shape context shape context was about taking a pixel and placing and getting a log polar representation of the neighborhood around the pixel using this kind of a representation this kind of a representation so you define a coordinate system in two dimensions that's parameterized by logarithmic distance from the origin which is the pixel at which you are trying to get the representation as well as the angle so for each point that you consider you would come count the number of points in each log polar bin around that particular pixel so you would so if this log polar representation you can see that there are perhaps something like 1 2 3 and four regions in terms of angular distance in terms of uh, log distance and then 12 bins in terms of the angles themselves so as you can see there's more precision for nearby points very similar to the gaussian kernel where you give more weightage to nearby points and then more flexibility for farther points around that pixel where we are considering the representation to some extent this method this representation is translation and scale invariant depending on the size of the neighborhood you take let's study this in a bit more detail so let's consider two different images so now if you considered this pixel so there are uh, if you cannot see carefully this is a circle this is a triangle and this is a rhombus so if you can see here you can get and the first one is the representation of the circle the second one is the representation of the rhombus and the third one is the representation of the triangle how did these representations come there are five bins in term in terms of log r or the log radial distance and 12 bins in terms of your theta or your angles around the center so you can see here that the circle and the rhombus have very similar representations so one could consider these two points as correspondence points between these two representations or these two images of a and when do we say two points are in correspondence we say two points in are in correspondence if they minimize a value of cij where cij i and j being two pixels that you are trying to measure and cij is defined as summation over k hik minus hjk whole square by hik plus hjk and hik and hjk are the histogram locations in the ith around the ith pixel and in the representation around the jth pixel which i is the histogram of the number of pixels in each of those bins around the ith pixel and hi similarly for the jth pixel hi of k would correspond to the count in one of those bins and what is small k or capital k capital k is the total number of bins right so for hi of k would be the count in one of those bins so when would cij get minimized when the numerator is zero or the histograms exactly match or when the histograms are fairly close to each other you would ensure that these values will turn out to be low the denominator ensures that you're also considering 
the number of pixels considered while evaluating this, very similar to how we spoke about in normalized cut and min cut, the denominator helps in normalizing based on the number of pixels that you're considering for your studies. So once you get these correspondence points between two images based on the representation, you could then do a one-to-one -one matching sequentially between these points, between these correspondence points. And when a distance is less, less than a threshold, this kind of an approach was used to check for a shape match, not just a point match, but matching shapes between two different images. That's the reason it was called a shape context. Another feature space or uh, important method that was proposed is known as the MSER or the maximally stable extremal regions. This was a method for blob detection based on watershed segmentation. So we just saw image segmentation in the previous lecture. Using one of those methods, which is simple watershed segmentation, that method is used to come up with a method for MSER or maximally stable extremal regions. And how does this work? You identify regions in an image that stay nearly the same as you keep varying a threshold. Let's try to describe this. So you would ideally sweep the threshold of an intensity going from white to black or black to white. And in each step, you're simply thresholding based on that particular intensity value. So if you have an intensity of 75, everything above that is white and everything below that is black, a simple thresholding operation. Then you extract connected components within that thresholded image. And the final region descriptors serve as the features. Let's see this more clearly with some illustrations. So let's say we start thresholding the images about a particular intensity level G. So which means you considered a threshold G and everything above that is considered to be white and everything below that is considered to be black. So you threshold, binary threshold your image based on the threshold G. Clearly, when you threshold, you're going to see a bunch of blobs or collections of pixels appear. They're going to be cohesive regions that appear together when you threshold. So, and as you increase the value or decrease the value of G, whatever it be, in this case, if you say decrease the value of G, newer regions would start appearing. If you decrease the value of G, you're now giving a lower threshold for considering regions to be white and the rest of them to be black. So there will be more regions that start appearing with white pixel values in the thresholded image. And if you increase G, things would start coalescing. And these regions that get developed as you keep changing G values can be depicted in a tree-like structure. It's very similar to region merging and region splitting. As you reduce G, some regions may merge. As you increase G, regions may split based on their intensity values. So now what do you do with this? So let regions at a particular G level be denoted as R1G to R2, R2, Rng. Let's say there are small m regions, each corresponding to one particular threshold G, where the cardinality of Rig denotes the total number of pixels in one of those regions Rig. Then we define a quantity psi, which is given by cardinality of Rj G minus delta minus cardinality of Rk, another region, G plus delta by Ri. Rj and Rk are parents and children of Ri, of that corresponding region, at slightly different thresholds G minus delta and G plus delta. Let's try to study this a bit more carefully. Remember again that Rig is one of the regions that you are considering at the threshold value G. Now, if you subtract a little value G minus delta, then you would get a parent region which is perhaps larger than Ri. Remember when you subtract the threshold, the region would get, the white region would probably get bigger. So you're going to have a parent region Rk which is defined at G minus delta. 
and at g plus delta when you increase the threshold the region may get smaller the white region may get smaller we are going to define that as a child and that's defined by rk and if this quantity psi which is the difference between rj and rk is below a user defined threshold you would call those regions to be maximally stable extremal regions remember if it is smaller than a, than a threshold it simply means that there is almost no change between the parent and the child if there is a lot of change then you probably need to expand a little bit further before calling it a stable or an extremal region here is a visual illustration so this is the input image as you can see it has some characters in it and when you set your threshold to be 75 assuming again that you use 8 bits to represent a pixel so values between 0 and 255 you see the regions not very clearly defined but when you go to g is equal to 105 you see regions getting slightly more well defined and you can see that at 135 there are few changes but not much at 165 a very minor changes not much again at 195 almost no change at 225 things again start going to black because the threshold is very high so you could now represent that as a tree where you start with a region those that region becomes two regions at uh, level g is equal to 105 and region 2 becomes region 4 and region 8 at level g is equal to 135 and so on and so forth to build the rest of the tree so finally as you can see at level g is equal to 195 you have two regions one with the k and the other with an r which is what you were originally looking for so this gives you one way of separating different regions so this is not exactly a corner detector but another method to separate regions so another way we said that it could also be used as a blob detector and here is an example for doing blob detection using maximally stable extremal regions so given this input image if you go from white to black or black to white the top two rows depict when you go from white to black and the bottom two rows depict when you go from black to white if you go from white to black you start with a high threshold and then you decrease the threshold more regions in black start showing up you decrease the threshold more regions in black start showing up and the regions start merging and you're finally left with as even as you change the threshold when regions don't change you know that that's actually a stable blob representation of your original image remember when you see it from a black to white you're going to look at it in terms of merging so you're going to say that when it's black obviously there's no region when you slightly increase certain regions start showing up and as you keep increasing the threshold this way and then go up to the third row you can see uh, more stable regions showing as you go forward so this is another approach to find out blobs or regions in an image called maximally sta stable extremal regions another famous method you probably have already been exposed to this when we talked about sift but this method was also independently developed to be able to detect humans in images is known as histograms of oriented gradients or popularly known as hog or hog so this originally was proposed in a paper that was used for human detection in different kinds of images so let's say you had a portion of an image or an image containing a human so at each location where the window is applied you compute gradients remember computing gradients is simply an edge detector whatever edge detector you want to choose and then you divide the entire gradient image into a uniformly spaced grid and then for every two cross two block in this grid you compute your orientations of the gradients very similar to how we talked about it for sift you would have say multiple orientations let's say you define eight different orientations you see how many pixels in that block had orientations of gradients in certain bins and you bin them to get a histogram for each two cross two block 
and you do this over overlapping two cross two blocks which gives you the histograms that you see on this image on every grid center so you can see here that each of these each of these is just a different way of drawing a histogram remember again if you recall something like this was just another way of drawing a histogram with eight bends in eight directions where the length of the arrow denotes the frequency count in each of those bends right this is just another way of representing that or this could be another way of representing the gradient orientations and just getting the histogram so the histogram of oriented gradients was shown to be very effective for detecting humans in an image in the mid 2000s and this was also improved upon to give what is known as pyramidal hog a p hog where in every at every step you divided the image into parts and constructed a hog representation for each part individually and then concatenated all of them to form a representation how do you do this you divide an image into 2l cross 2l cells at each pyramid level l so if l was 1 you would divide it into a two cross the entire image into a two cross two cells four cells or if l was 2 you would divide it into four cross four so on and so forth now for each of these cells you extract hod hog descriptors just the way we spoke about on the previous slide and then you concatenate the hogs at different pyramid levels to give an entire histogram of oriented gradients representation so as you can see this can be done in several ways you would get a histogram of uh, oriented gradients for each cell and concatenate all of them and then you would get a histogram of oriented gradient at l is equal to 0 l is equal to 1 and you can concatenate all of this also to get your final representation so this method was shown to capture spatial relationships between say objects a little bit better than hog which doesn't do this at a pyramid level another popular method which was extensively used for face images in particular human human faces was known as local binary patterns local binary patterns had an interesting idea where given an image for every pixel you take for example a 3 cross 3 neighborhood around a pixel so this is the id hyderabad logo so you consider a pixel and a 3 cross 3 neighborhood around the pixel write down the intensity values of the of those pixels now with respect to the central pixel you decide if each of the other pixels around it were lower or higher if it was lower you would set a zero if it is equal or higher you can set it to one that now gives you a binary pattern around the central pixel once you define a canonical representation which means you say i'll start at the top left and then go in a circular manner you can define a binary representation for this particular pixel once again i'll repeat that so you define a binary representation based on how each pixel is relate, related to the central pixel's intensity so now this value is now 15 in decimal and you replace that pixel's value with 15 other values around it would similarly be obtained by doing an lbt position at that particular pixel and so on and so forth now what do you do with this new lbp representation before we go there you can also define neighborhoods in multiple ways we said you would take a 3 by 3 neighborhood and take the eight pixels around it that may not be always the case you can vary two different parameters here you can define your radius r you can also define the number of neighbors p so you can have a particular radius where you want to compute your local binary pattern width that need not be the immediate neighbor it can be a radius of 4 5 pixels around the central pixel and you can also define how many neighbors you want at that radius so you could define p is equal to 8 the number of neighbors is 8 and r is equal to 2 as you can see that's the example that you see on this particular image similarly you could have a closer neighborhood r is equal to 1 but the number of neighbors to be same p is equal to 
Similarly, you could have at r is equal to 2, you could increase the number of neighbors and make it p is equal to 12 and at r is equal to 3, further out, you could still have 12 neighbors. Once you define the neighbors, if these neighbors lie in between two pixels, you can use bilinear interpolation to get those values. So once you define r and p, based on those values, you would get a binary pattern around the central pixel. You write that out in a circular manner as a binary number, convert it into decimal and replace the central pixel with that particular value. What do you do with that? So once you get an LPP result, which is your LPP intensity for each pixel, remember the previous process that we talked about in the earlier slide, gives you one decimal for each pixel around which you considered the neighborhood. So you could now construct such an image for every pixel. You could repeat the same thing and construct such an LBP image. Once you do this, you divide the LBP result into regions or grids. And once again, you can get a histogram of each region, the number of pixels in each region in this particular case, and concatenate all of them to be able to get a single representation for a region or an entire image. In this case, we are not considering the gradients, it's simply the histogram, but you could also improve LBP to consider gradients in each cell, so on and so forth. And there have been several improvements of LBP or local binary patterns that have considered these kinds of variations. So here is a quick summary of various feature detectors. We have seen some of them. We may not have the scope to see all of them, but you are welcome to look at the source of this particular table to understand more features, but you can view all features in terms of whether they are corner detectors, blob detectors, or do they help in finding the regions, whether they are rotation invariant, scale invariant, affine invariant, how repeatable are they? Remember, repeatability is about ensuring that if you found a particular pixel to be a corner in a particular image, if you had the same image taken from a different angle, in another picture or same scene taken as a picture in another angle, that corner should also be detected as a corner in the second image. This is known as repeatability. How good is the localization accuracy? Remember, we talked about localization accuracy even for the canny edge detector, where we said, is the point exactly where it should be or is it a few pixels uh, away from the actual corner that we know? How robust is the method to noise? and how fast is the method. So these are various parameters in which using which you can evaluate the goodness of the methods that we have discussed so far. So the Harris corner detector, let's take a few of them and just go over them. The Harris is a corner detector. It is rotation invariant as we have seen, not necessarily scale or affine invariant as we already saw. It's fairly repeatable. It's reasonably good with localization accuracy, robustness, as well as efficiency. Let's take another one. Let's consider SURF, which is an improvement over SIFT that we saw a couple of lectures back, which is a corner detector or a blob detector. It can be used either way. It is rotation invariant and scale invariant. That's the purpose of SIFT and SURF to be scale invariant. It's in the name of SIFT itself. And it's also fairly repeatable fairly accurate in terms of localization, robustness, and is extremely efficient. We know, we saw that SURF is almost three times as fast as SIFT. So you can similarly look at say MSER, which is the one that we just saw a few slides ago, is a region detector, which is reasonably rotation invariant, scale invariant, and affine invariant. And it's also is repeatable, accurate in terms of localization, robustness, and efficiency more details of other feature detectors, please look at this in the references and you can look at the paper to get a more detailed survey of other feature extractors. Why are we not discussing each of these is what we are going to talk about next, which is a lot of representations of images that used to be used in the pre-deep learning era have are no, no, no longer relevant because of the success of deep learning 
in extracting features that are extremely good for various computer vision tasks. Remember when we talked about the history of deep learning, we said that in the mid 1960s, Marvin Minsky started out with a summer project to be able to solve the problem of computer vision. But many decades later, deep learning has been able to significantly make that progress at this time. So the homework for this is going to be reading chapters 4.1.1 and 4.1.2. If you're further interested about other feature detectors, please do read some of these links as well as some of these references. In particular, this reference gives an overview of various different feature detectors if you are interested.